And by the time the Soviet re Revolution came around, which would be uh, at, at the latter part of the 1910s, after the First World War, the peasant class had actually established farms, of course, varying productivity. Some of the peasant farmers were very, very good at being farmers and produced a huge proportion of Russia's and the Ukraine's food. Uh, because one of the things, we'll talk about this later as the class progresses, one of the things that you'll find if, the, if you look at creative production in any domain, it doesn't matter, artistic domain, food production, um, novels written, novels sold, money generated, number of companies generated, um, number of goals scored in hockey, etc. Any, any, or no, number of paintings painted, number of compositions written, anything like that, where, where the fundamental underlying measure is human productivity, what you find is that a very tiny percentage of people produce almost all the output. It's called a Pareto distribution, P-A-R-E-T-O. And it was studied in detail in scientific productivity by someone named DeSola Price. It's a square root law, so here's the law fundamentally. If you look at the number of people who are doing, who are, who are in a given domain, who are producing in a given domain, the square root of the people produce half the product. So that means if you have 10 employees, three of them do half the work. But if you have 10,000 employees, 100 of them do half the work. Right. It's a very, very vicious statistic. And you won't learn about that in psychology for reasons I have no idea about, because you learn about the normal distribution and not the Pareto distribution. But Pareto distributions govern, for example, the distribution of money, which is why 1% of the people in the general population have the overwhelming amount of money and one-tenth of that one percent has almost all of that right so I think it's like the richest hundred people in the world have as much money as the bottom two and a half billion and you think well that's a terrible thing and perhaps it is but what you have to understand is that that law governs the distribution of creative production across all creative domains right it's something like a natural law and we can, we'll talk about that more, but imagine what happens when you play Monopoly. You've all played Monopoly. What happens when you play Monopoly? One person ends up with all the money. All right, then you play another game of Monopoly. What happens? One person ends up with all the money. It's actually the inevitable consequence of multiple trades that are conducted randomly. So if you take a thousand people and you get them to play a trading game, you, get, you each give them hundred dollars, say, or ten dollars, and they have to trade with another person by flipping a coin, I, I win the coin toss, you give me a dollar, you win, I give you a dollar. If we all play that long enough, one person will end up with all the money and everyone else will end up with zero. So it's a deeply built feature of systems of creative production and no one really knows what to do about it because of course the danger is, is that all the resources get funneled to a tiny minority of people at the top and a huge section of the population stacks up at zero. But to blame that on the oppressive nature of a given system is to radically underestimate the complexity of the problem. No one actually knows how to effectively shovel resources from the minority that, that controls almost everything to the majority that has almost nothing in any consistent way. Because as you shovel money down, it tends to move right back up. And it's a big problem. Anyways, the reason I'm telling you about that is because after the peasants were granted their land and started to become farmers, a tiny minority of them became extremely successful and those people produced almost all of the food for Russia and, and the Ukraine. So what happened in the 1920s when bloody Lenin came along and collectivized the farms was that they defined the Kulaks, who were these tiny minority of successful farmers who maybe had a brick house and were able to hire a couple of people and had some land and some livestock and were very, very productive people. They defined them as socially unfriendly elements and they sent groups of intellectuals out into the towns to collectivize the farms. And so the idea was that while well, you would pool your land and, and everyone would farm it collectively and the land was taken away, of course, from the tiny minority of people who were actually productive and had actually managed to own much of the land. So you have to imagine how that would occur. Okay, so it's in the 1920s. It's after, the world, after World War I. Russia's in pretty bad shape. The villages are full of brutalized men who have post-traumatic stress disorder and lots of people who are not doing well at all and the bloody intellectuals come into the town and they say you know those successful farmers up the street that you've always been pretty jealous about in your useless manner well they're actually pigs and demons who are stealing from you so why don't you come out we'll form a nice little mob and we'll take everything they've got and that's exactly what happened and all those people were killed or raped 
or set off to Siberia in the middle of the bloody winter where there wasn't even anything for them to, to anywhere for them to live or anything for them to eat. So they all died. And then the consequence of that was a few years later, six million people starved to death in the Ukraine.